My talk today presents a new project that Kevin is involved in. It's called Shakespeare in Virtue, a Handbook, and it will be published by Cambridge in the next two years. The group of us, 40 scholars in all, argue that virtue, rooted in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy and in global wisdom literatures, illuminates the affective lives of Shakespeare's characters, along with their participation in shared worlds, the powers they exercise for the creation and destruction of community, and the responsibilities that they confer on their audiences and readers. In Twelfth Night, Feste declares, anything that's mended is but patched, virtue that transgresses is but patched with sin, and sin that amends is but patched with virtue. In All's Well That Ends Well, Shakespeare draws a similar sentiment, quote, the web of our life is of a mingled yarn, good and evil together. Our virtues would be proud if our faults would them not, and our crimes would despair if they were not cherished by our virtues." Close quote. In both passages, Shakespeare tempers a humanist confidence in virtuous self-fashioning with a darker, more Augustinian vision of human sinfulness. Virtue as a patch does not restore the soul's fabric to lost perfection, but leaves its stitches legible, rendering one's spiritual domain a motley of histories requiring further work. Within a tangle of conflicting tendencies and failed projects, the mingled yarn traces a provisional order, a way through the labyrinth of life. In both instances, virtue retains its power to, to patch and darn, to mend and repair, which in a damaged world of thoughtlessness, greed, and cruelty, describes so much of what it means to be moral. We see Shakespeare's patched and mingled virtues as contributing to a thick liberalism in which overlapping sets of shared ends and goals are fostered through co-created stories about where a society has come and where it wants to go. Virtues such as kindness, hospitality, care, humility, and trust make room for a robust pluralism with respect to both politics and wisdom. Respect, with one foot in the zone of modern tolerance, and another in the history of awe and reverence, pivots between ancient and modern virtues and models the possibility of bridging them. The age of Shakespeare inherited classical and monotheistic virtues, but it also stood on the cusp of the modern ethics of Rousseau, Kant, and Hume. Shakespeare remixes ancient and modern ethics along with secular and religious worldviews and thus expands the scope of virtue in early modernity and the contemporary world. This weave of multiple legacies provokes an important point about how we consider history in this book. Some of the virtue traditions featured here, such as Stoicism and skepticism, have lineages that clearly extend to Shakespeare's life. Shakespeare may not have directly encountered the work of Aristotle, but Aristotle's impact was everywhere having entered Christendom through his uptake by Islamic and Jewish philosophers. Our volume aims to maintain an awareness of the wisdom literatures that supplied the cultural texture and room tone of Shakespeare's era. We also want to celebrate his play's capacities to converse with thinkers across time and space, as entries on Buddhism and on Black theology demonstrate. This volume is a handbook. Philosophers from Epictetus to Erasmus wrote handbooks or Enchiridia that presented philosophy as a broadly teachable practice relevant to daily life. In Shakespeare's age, housewives and physicians also composed and read handbooks to help them manage the complex ecologies of their enterprises. Handbooks have become popular in academic publishing as a way of collecting major statements on a topic 
in a digestible and definitive form. This volume contributes to that model, but also aims to return the handbook as a genre to its origins in the ancient and Caridian. And we hope that readers will feel invited to consider the transformative potentialities of their own classrooms, households, and communities. We posit that humanist pedagogy already cultivates virtues such as prudence, respect, courage, trust, service, and care. And we contend that a more intentional approach to virtue will actually amplify the capacity building outcomes of liberal education. Shakespeare does not mobilize his drama to endorse any particular virtue or virtue ethics so much as he creates entire worlds, which we call virtue ecologies, that comprise the cognitive, affective, social, and physical environment in which human agents develop their person-affirming capacities. The open sea frequently pictures the risky environments in which human beings exercise virtues that consist of their attunement to the needs and outlooks of other people, the shifting dangers and affordances of the situation, and their own skills and strengths. The sea is an emblem of what philosophers call moral luck, the idea that happiness and the good life, though requiring virtuous activity, are also contingent on external affairs, from the circumstances of one's own birth and social condition, slave or free, black or white, rich or poor, male or female, to the privations of disease, loss of livelihood, bereavement, enslavement, and war. The scandal of such contingency would lead the Stoics to fashion an ideal of happiness largely divorced from material circumstances with profound implications first for Christianity and then for Kant. Aristotle's virtues are more worldly, however, realized in the world through practices that act upon the world and also exposing the actor to the world. At the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle asserts that the virtues, quote, result from the body and are closely bound up with the passions, close quote. The virtues, he writes further, are, quote, concerned with what is composite in us. And the virtues of this composite thing is called human, close quote. In The Fragility of Goodness, Martha Nussbaum is attuned to those moments in Aristotle in which the flow of virtue becomes a patchwork of inhibitions and impediments. The metaphor of flourishing, often used to translate eudaimonia or happiness as the goal and outcome of virtuous activity, implies an ecosystem of mutual dependencies that require communal tending. The mingled yarn of virtue is the effort at narrative sense-making that winds through landscapes of brutalizing self-interest and shattered trust in search of restored connections. Shakespeare's plays stage the fragility of goodness. Whether virtue is cynically weaponized in a tragedy like Othello, where Iago weaves the virtues of Othello, Desdemona, and Cassio into a net to snare them all, or when heroes are exposed to chance and deprived of basic resources, like the political exiles, climate refugees, and gender outliers of King Lear, Pericles, As You Like It, and Twelfth Night. Depicting the vicissitudes of moral luck in emblematic environments such as city, sea, and forest, Shakespeare enjoins us to evaluate the patched and mingled character of human action within settings composed of the energy, skills, powers, and privileges that unevenly shape the pursuit of happiness for a plurality of actors. Echoing Hamlet, the theologian Paul Tillich identified virtue with what he called the courage to be, the will to choose being over non-being by exiting the dormancies of routine, embracing the risks of attachment, and confronting the terrors of guilt and uncertainty. Tillich's friend, Hannah Arendt, defined courage as, quote, 
the act of leaving one's private hiding place and showing who one is, disclosing and exposing oneself, close quote. These definitions of courage as existential self-disclosure already indicate virtue's deep connection with drama and dramaturgy. When Hamlet describes theater as a mirror that shows virtue her feature, scorn her own image, he is asking drama to enact moral situations on stage in a manner that clarifies values and prompts self-reflection. But he's going deeper than that. To mirror is to manifest, to make what is latent or unremarked tangible and visible. Such manifestation occurs every time theater makers reach deep into the text to find the very age and body of the time, Shakespeare's time, but also their own. The ecology of the theatrical zone, with its improvisations, flourishes, failures, miscues, thunderous applauses, collaborative labors, and shared breath, is one of interdependence. Theater requires constant attunement to the shifts of energy, patterns of speech, and ineffable qualities that compel our attention. Shakespearean drama repeatedly manifests a collaborative conjuring of drama out of the trained attention of actors and audiences. Together, the actors and the audience build what Hippolyta calls something of great constancy. Constancy means consistency, their story holds together, but constancy is also a virtue. It's the strength and will to remain true to an idea or a person within a changing situation. The constancy exercised by both actors and audiences sustains even the most chaotic of performances, even one as stumbling and makeshift as that of the rude mechanicals. Since their original staging, the plays have been taken up and recomposed by global performance traditions, which are also wisdom traditions. Shakespeare's continued presence in contemporary teaching grants him unique status as a vehicle for the kind of cross-disciplinary and pedagogical work that this conference has celebrated. His work remains stubbornly, ingeniously, an ensemble of virtue exercises for us to test and train our own moral and dynamic skills. For some readers, the virtues may inspire political activism and social justice projects. And for others, the virtues may issue in a renewed pedagogy or more conscientious mentoring. For some, the virtues may foster community teaching and public humanities. And for others, the virtues may initiate the search for recovery, reconciliation, and healing. It is certainly the case that for me, considering Shakespeare and virtue has really helped refocus my work as a scholar, a teacher, and a public humanist. Thank you.